Hey everyone, this is Ross Raddy and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys. Every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, we talk all about fruits and vegetables, the really weird and interesting ones, as well as um, you know how to use that stuff in the kitchen and, and also how to grow it. So in today's video, I kind of want to give you guys a big update and that's mostly what I have prepared for you guys. Um, usually we come in here with a nice little topic, but it's been a while since I really gave any sort of garden update or orchard update, I feel like in quite some time. My camera actually got a nice little scratch in it on the lens, and then I also broke the microphone. I was using a tripod, as many of you guys recommend that I do, and um, yeah, the tripod fell over, and then the camera got a nice little scratch, and then also the microphone broke. So. I have uh, fortunately have plenty of videos kind of lined up as it is and um, I'm trying to kind of um, rig the microphone up in a way that's going to be sort of suitable for filming but there is some background noise and it's really minor but it's still an, uh, it's still there and it's pretty annoying and um, there's just some weird weak point in the microphone uh, in the design so if it falls over I guess at any point uh, I guess that is the point in which it's going to break, right? It's always some weird little thing, you know, some weird little point in the design. The lens, I think, is okay. There's a nice little scratch in the lens, but I've noticed it for quite a bit, actually, in some of the videos. And unless you really know that it's there and that's what it is, I don't think anyone really notices or even cares. No one said anything. So the lens I'm not going to replace, but the microphone I think I'm certainly going to have to um, even just attaching the microphone to the to the camera itself has become quite uh, troublesome because if the microphone moves in any way or touches any single thing, it makes a noise that the, then the microphone picks up and you can kind of hear it. So, but the big announcement, I guess, there's a couple announcements and the big real exciting thing that's been going on with the channel here is that it's definitely been over a year. Um, since we've been doing a video every single day. So I have put out a video every single day for a, an entire year. And um, ah, that's just, it's just incredible. I cannot believe it. <laughs> I'm really blown away. Um, I never had any intentions of doing this, but it happened. And I think we started sometime last May around this time. Maybe it's not exactly uh, a year yet, or maybe uh, we're off by a couple days, but I'm pretty sure it's actually over a year now, which is really nuts. And I don't know if uh, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna definitely keep doing this in the meantime. Um, but if anyone has any opinions on this, if I should keep doing it, if I should go back to something I was doing years ago, maybe I should make less videos with uh, more editing. Um, let me know. So far, I've been really liking this format, getting as much information and content out to you guys as possible. I think it's been really incredible. I can't believe there's not more people watching the channel right now. Um, it has certainly doubled. The viewership has doubled since the fall of last year. So uh, that's exciting. Um, so maybe the hard work that we did over the wintertime is paying off, but... Um, I think that was probably naturally going to happen sort of anyway, you know, as you create more videos, YouTube kind of in their algorithm, you know, lets people see some of them and it kind of gets attention. Certain videos just get attention for certain reasons. And, um, you know, it just kind of grows on its own. It's not like I have to really, really go out of my way to grow it, but certainly putting more work into the channel is paying off. So. Um, I'm really appreciative of everyone that's been watching, even if you're just brand new, even if you're brand new to the uh, the podcast here, I'm really appreciative of everybody on YouTube. Um, so I guess, you know, we're done with the announcement. That was the big announcement, I think. Uh, what I want to talk about is kind of you know, just an update real far, real quick here. Try to get as much information out to you guys. Like I said, I haven't been filming for quite some time. Um, I haven't filmed a video since probably like May 9th or so. Um, and today is May 21st, the day, the day that I'm filming this. So it's been 
quite some time since I've talked about anything in the orchard or the garden, at least to me. It doesn't seem like that to you guys. But in that time period, a lot has changed. I mean, so much changes day to day. It's incredible, especially this time of the year, early spring. We're getting into the summer. Things just go nuts. I mean, everything is fully leafed out for the most part. Everything is just going crazy with growth because we've had a pretty weak May in the beginning. It was definitely sort of weak um, compared to April, I would say. April was fantastic out of this world. Uh, you normally don't have an April like that. Usually that's kind of the, sea, the weather we see in May. And that kind of woke things up really soon and then we didn't get that frost we were expecting and then may the beginning of may like the first week first two weeks maybe of may were not really that great we had lots of rain um we're still getting pretty good amounts of rain but now things have really warmed up it's been really warm here in the philadelphia area uh we're getting days easily in the 70s every day and you know we're seeing definitely temperatures in the high 80s now we're going to hit 90 degrees pretty soon. We may have already. I'm not entirely sure. But I think this past weekend it may have done that. Um, so as a result, all the food that I've been feeding the figs, I've done four different four different um, fertilizer regimens, four different shots of fertilizer to all of my fig trees. We talked about it here on the blog, rossratty.wixsite.com slash blog talking about how the figs are way ahead of schedule and for four weeks in a row every week we had fed our trees a dose of fertilizer of the fast release fertilizer it's 9 45 15 those are the NPK numbers it's just Jack's fast release liquid fertilizer and that stuff you know it's basically miracle grow in a way um, I mean I'm sure there's not much difference chemically in it um, so essentially that's been working really well in terms of getting these trees lots of energy and that combined with the heat that we've been getting the early start plus the heat has really put these trees in a position that's very beneficial i was looking back at some old videos um, that i filmed this time last year and we are way ahead we're at least two weeks ahead i would say maybe even three um, and I'm able to actually go around to my trees. I did this yesterday and the day before we pinched a lot of our trees um, A lot of the early varieties You know the varieties that didn't get a head start in the greenhouse that came out normal wake-up period Those are now putting out at least six leaves a piece on each new limb um, And once you hit that six leaf, it's it's not guaranteed that you're going to get fruit, but by the sixth leaf, you can pretty much say that, you know, um, you got some really thick and healthy, strong limbs to be able to support that that fruit. So, I would say uh, we're way ahead of the uh, ahead of the game, and even varieties that uh, didn't get a head start that are mid season, kind of like my Violette de Bordeaux, kind of like uh, my English brown turkeys, even my Adriatic types like. Sister Madeline's Green Greek as an example. All those figs are just on the same wavelength, the same point in time as all of the early varieties, which has never happened. A lot of times my early varieties, uh, well, they, they're on the same point in which they are in terms of growth, but um, I can certainly always end up pinching my early varieties much earlier. And you might be able to think that, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to know for sure until the end, until about maybe 90 days from today, but we're keeping track of how many days it takes each variety to fruit after you pinch. So we'll keep track of that. Um, and then we'll know for sure if the really, if there really is a big difference in varieties in terms of how many days each variety takes. Um, but all the varieties are on the same the same point in time for the most part the same amount of growth so if we can all pinch them all yesterday that means that based on when they ripen is going to be essentially how long it takes for that fig to ripen after you pinch it so it's pretty cool um, it'll be a nice experiment nice knowledge that we can gain from that you know today's only May 21st so we're looking at probably even the early varieties if they do indeed take 75 days after pinching for to fruit you know that's 
75 days from today. Um, how, what date is that? So that is the August 4th. So I'm looking at not just fruit from the early varieties probably in August 4th, but also from the late varieties, um, even maybe even before that. I think a lot of our fruits are going to end up ripening around this time. And uh, the large majority of them will be definitely 90 days from today to be safe, which is mid-August. And I think mid-August is a great time to be getting a lot of these figs coming in because last year the majority of them came in sometime around September 1st. So that's two weeks earlier than, um, than we're used to. So I'm really excited to, uh, to see that, is that we're really getting the numbers, we're really getting the, um, the fruits just coming in way earlier that's gonna ripen in better conditions. So overall the fig season is off to an incredible start. Um, I could talk all about that more and more on the blog post here. And we're gonna come out with a video soon about getting earlier fruit and kind of why that's important. Um, let's see, what else did I want to mention here? We did, um, oh, another a couple announcements real quick before I tell you guys more about what's going on in the orchard and the garden. Is that we did some fig tastings over the years and I put them all together here in a spread, in a playlist so that you guys can go back to this playlist and check it out. Um, just go to this playlist and see um, any variety you want to look at and there's the review that we've done. So there's 59 videos here. I'd say maybe about 50 varieties maybe in total. But uh, that's pretty good. It's not bad. I've tasted definitely more than 50 varieties but in terms of the videos that we've done on them um, so far we only have 59. We also did and we've been doing this for quite some time is the 250 days of gardening playlist and we've been trying to add more and more videos to this and try to get you guys more into gardening because um, annuals are just way better than perennials when you're first starting out because annuals will fruit for you and produce for you that year whereas a lot of perennials really don't come into their own until year three year four so for me I think a garden is a big important thing to have um, also, we have a playlist here on growing figs, and we actually have done a hundred, almost a hundred and twenty. We've probably definitely done at least one hundred and twenty videos on growing figs, and this is a culmination, a compilation here of all the videos we've done, and all these playlists are just really handy, I think, for people to use. So, if anyone's interested in learning how to grow figs, I mean, if you watch all these videos, you're gonna know pretty much as much as I know right now. So um, yeah, there's a lot of content here. <laughs> it's a lot of time. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to be like, oh, we should binge watch this whole thing. But it's a lot. So, um, you know, definitely take your time with this. But I've been really overwhelmed by the amount of people that have been watching my videos, especially the fig videos on um, just what we've been doing so far this year. Um, we're not really talking too much more at this point about how to grow them because we've already kind of covered things on these topics at this point it's more about the fruit and talking about the fruit and talking about the different varieties that exist and um, you know talking about different things revolving around that you know showing you guys how to grow them it's kind of already done you know um, in terms of the timeline that we have here which is also on the blog um, if you guys go in the blog post, you can see the fig tree timeline for the Philadelphia area. And let's see here. Here's May 1st, May 15th to June 15th. This is when we should be up potting, planting, grafting, rooting, um, staking, putting on air layers. That's more of like the propagation. And then we're talking about pinching, but we've already talked about pinching. And then we have to wait all the way pretty much until August and September. There's a big gap with the figs, and that's really just the fruit. So, um, yeah, there's just not a whole lot going on right now with figs anymore. So we'll, we can kind of come at you guys, and hopefully I can keep um, doing this, keep coming at you guys with more videos. But for the most part, that's sort of it. We're going to do a nice little tour 
and I think we filmed these guys, these videos here on my birthday, May 7th. So uh, it's been quite a bit of time since then. And I kind of want to show you guys what the trees look like now because they're so far ahead of when these this video was filmed that I almost feel like I shouldn't even put these two videos out. You know, these are scheduled for this weekend. So maybe we'll come in here um, tomorrow if I have time and film as much as I can. I Actually, I don't think I will be able to, but maybe on, um, yeah, not, not even Thursdays. So maybe Friday we'll have some time to do this, but... Um, if not, you know, this is kind of what you guys are going to get and maybe we'll do another update on the figs later in the season. Um, but yeah, uh, let's see what else is going on in the season right now. So we planted all of our figs and we did a nice little video here on that and we still have about six to eight more of them left to go into the ground, um, which is still quite a bit in terms of work. <laughs> But we're almost there and um, you know the trees in the ground actually are growing really well because the soil certainly warmed up we're getting those higher temperatures and um, even the rooted cuttings even the really weak trees that we put in the ground are doing phenomenal even the cuttings that we just stuck in the ground um, for the most part all of those have rooted and are putting out leaves as well it's kind of insane so um, the figs are planted also the garden bed where all the heat loving crops are, the tomatoes, the peppers, the eggplants, the melons, all of that is going berserk. The tomato plants are like, like two and a half feet tall at this point. They're really massive plants and um, almost all of them are flowering. Um, I've already had them taken off Lakota with suckers. They transplanted really well. They had a huge root system all the heat in that area really made them take off and um, they have just have been growing ever since I put them in the ground even in that really bad early May weather we had they were still growing and still doing fine I think because the weather in that location was really good or it is really warm in that location um, the melons we've had a little bit of trouble with and what I've decided to do was actually start more melons and I'm trying to see, I don't think I have a picture of them, but I do have melons that have been transplanted in the same time as the tomatoes, but because the soil was so cold, they kind of probably even suffered some transplant shock. They didn't look too good even when I when they went in. A lot of the melons are not doing well. Even the sugar snap peas, because they're so tall at this point, um, we direct seeded a lot of those. We even talked about the sugar snap pea, which is my favorite garden snack for this time of the year from like, you know, May 1st to May 15th. Um, this is it. You know, this is the best snack. And these guys, we went crazy with them, planting them all over the place because they're just so damn good. And because they're so good uh, and because we've had so many plants, they they're kind of shading out the melon plants right now. Um, so r realistically, even even though they're not doing well, they're even doing even worse because of kind of the conditions I've got them in. In fact, we can see it here in this video probably. With the, yeah, here's, so here's all these plants that are huge. And then down here, <laughs> right down in here is a melon plant, this little thing. So these, uh, <laughs> these sugar snap peas are like two feet tall pretty much. And the melon is maybe six inches off the ground, you know? So, um, I kind of want these to fruit that was the whole objective with these and then to get the melons in the ground by June 1st which we're getting there and these sugar snap peas still really haven't done much they they're flowering right now they have at least about three to four flowers per plant um, or some of them have already set but they're kind of behind schedule even as big as they are and as vigorous they are it's kind of uh, disappointing to see because um, I'm going to really be behind on my melon crop this year. And we wanted to take that very seriously. So what I've done is that I've started some in flats. And I put them in the greenhouse. This way, um, they're already kind of adjusted to the heat and the conditions and, and the sunlight. And I don't have to really harden them off by starting them indoors. 
you know, that's another week of me kind of hardening them off. And I just think this is a better way to do it from now on. I think at this time of the year, this is really when it's going to happen for me. I shouldn't really bother with larger melon transplants. Get them in a large of a pot as I can. Put the seed in there and get them to germinate. And that's sort of it. You know, leave them, um, you know, put them in at a small size too. That's another big key is getting them in probably longer pots taller pots and um, you know transplanting them really when they only have about two or three of their true leaves and that's it you know uh, they really need to go in kind of right away and I was tempted to even just direct seed them and not even really start them in a flat but the snap peas are here and also I just think starting them in the greenhouse has really increased the germination really gotten things off to a good start um, gotten the right conditions so who knows, maybe I will come in here as well and just direct seed some as soon as I take out the snap peas and kind of have just my insurance covered in all directions. You know, you got the transplants we started sometime April 1st, then you've got the transplants we started very recently, and then you've also, on May 15th we started those. And then also maybe even the direct seeded um, melons that we can also put in the ground right away. Um, Maybe even right now. I thought about that, but I don't know. I think it's they're really tricky and really finicky plants, these things. So we'll see what happens, what I end up doing. But I think whatever the case is, we're not too late. Like nothing's really out of the question yet, you know. Um, the biggest question for the melons is going to be pretty much Fusarium wilt. So if we can keep that at bay, hopefully we can... Um, ensure that these plants get off to a good start and then or we should be able to ensure that they get off to a good start and then by the time of the you know the plants are really getting time to be ripe and really getting um in their groove here the fusarium wilt is nowhere to be found you know that's the that's the real objective here so um there's that and then you know i also need to come in here and do some corn we're gonna put in a lot of the three different varieties of corn, but I'm kind of not sure if I can really make it work because corn needs a lot of plants, needs a lot of pollination. And last year was our first year growing corn and it just didn't work out. You know, we didn't have great pollination. Um, you know, I think I also had the corn plants spaced too close together. Um, perhaps we even need better soil in those locations. I'm not entirely sure, but the point is I'm, we're trying them in a smaller circle area and we're going to do multiple circles and then another circle. They're going to be roughly in a six to seven square foot space and fitting as many corn plants into those into that six square foot space that I can and then essentially having multiple circles of those in close proximity so that Hopefully that's enough to get good pollination. I kind of am doubting it, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm not going to be too negative on it, but you know, this would be the second year of failure if I were to mess this up. And I just don't know, and I kind of don't want to waste the space if it's not going to work out. You know, uh, let's see. We also have the peaches. We've thinned out about 500. I would say easily 500 peaches off the trees and we're roughly left with about 500 peaches on the trees. I really tried to th keep them um, really thinned out towards the top areas, but that's kind of how the plant works and fruit works in general is that when your branches are pointed downwards or even horizontal, they put on more fruit when if they're growing straight up in the air, they don't fruit as much. So the branches really up towards the top of the tree which are very high and very vigorous and out of my reach i didn't want a lot of fruit up there but there's not a lot of fruit up there anyway because they're just very vigorous shoots so for me i kind of left as many fruits as i could on those horizontal and even downward pointing branches um, to make those more accessible to me but also easier to protect and um yeah it just it just makes more sense that way so um we're gonna do a video on the pinching, on the um, the thinning out of the fruits. We're gonna talk about why to do that and all that. Um, we've also have lots of potatoes that have finally come up, 
and we planted all those we talked about those it was the german butterball we talked about why and how we're planting the potatoes um let's see here it was sometime in like i think early early april if i'm not mistaken um but this was a really interesting way of doing it that uh that kid in England does. I'm not entirely sure what his name is. I forget, but um, Hughes Nursery, that's him. But planting potatoes for zero maintenance. This was the video we did, and German Butterball was the variety. And it actually did, I think they're going to do really, really well. I'm impressed by how many eyes have come up, how many new shoots they have. Um, really, it's just putting the potato on the ground and covering it with lots of straw. That's really all you do. Um, so there's plenty of potatoes coming up. Um, we've also got all kinds of vegetables still in the cool loving crop garden. Um, the cool loving crops are going nuts for the most part. A lot of it though is starting to flower because it's getting quite warm. This is just that time of the year and if you don't really get this stuff out now or uh, earlier in the season to then have it by really about June 1st, June 15th, you just are not going to get it. You're just not. So. Um, I really did a great job this year of getting all that stuff out there early, selecting the right bed for all this. The bed made the biggest difference. Whichever bed I put it in was a big difference between other beds. So highly recommend that um, when you're thinking about growing vegetables, think about where the sun is orientated, obviously. And then at an earlier point in the season, that's the trick sometime in March, sometime in April, when the season's really just beginning, things are really just starting to warm up, figure out where the sun is the most and put the garden bed there. And I think that really, really makes a huge difference with the cool oven crops. For the fall oven crops, we actually are gonna start, I think, some cold frames. We're gonna make some cold frames this year. I have lots of leftover wood from the raised beds that we tore down. By the way, just about everything is planted now. Other than about six to eight figs, everything's in the ground. We have a number of persimmons in um, that was kind of left, kind of figuring that whole thing out. Um, even the Girardi mulberry that we grafted onto the Illinois Everbearing, that seems to have taken on two, at least two of the bark grafts that we did. The bark graft video, actually, I don't think we've done yet, but we did a bark graft and showing you guys how to do that. I think I still have to edit that one. That was... A really tough one to film and do at the same time it was just sort of impossible um, so we're gonna come in here with a voiceover and add in my directions as as it is kind of playing in front of us um, but that has taken um, what else is kind of that we kind of plant we had a whole lot of plans that we talked about like between the peaches the plums the pe the pears the the apricots um, the all the apples that we planted even the muscadine grapes are in um everything's going crazy i mean it's just really really nice to see the comfrey is flowering we have really not that many flowers at this time of the year it's kind of insane to think about because i really tried to plant as many flowering plants that i could get and find and comfrey is really the only one this maybe the strawberries a lot of the fruiting plants flower early but a lot of the fruiting plants are done flowering for the most part. I mean, the strawberries, they're like endless, them damn things. But it's just really strange to see that nothing around this time of the year is really flowering. Um, one of the big worries of the yard and the year is SWD, spotted wing drosophilia. And we have a tree in the backyard. It's a black cherry tree. And this thing in prior years has fruited so heavily and then the fruit drops off the tree because it's a big shade tree. It's very old and the fruit just sits there on the ground. I mean, nothing eats it. And then the SWD comes in because then it starts to ferment and you have yourself a huge issue. So it's really important to kind of get that fruit up off the ground. And it looks like last year I got away with nothing. Something had come in at the time that they were blooming, um, some weather event had knocked off a lot of those flowers and then the tree ended up not fruiting. So I didn't have any issues with SWD until very late in the season. So 
This year, the tree is loaded with flowers, and it looks like I haven't seen many of them set yet, which is good news for now. But I'm really worried that that tree, again, is going to fruit and put out just tons and tons of fruit. Then I'm going to have to go around the yard and spend a couple hours at least trying to get up every single fruit that I can. So we'll see how that works out, but uh, that's a big worry of mine in the yard. Um, the apples have also been fruiting, but not many of them. Um, I think because we transplanted them out, um, I think maybe because we didn't have the best pollination. Um, I'm not really too worried about getting apples this year. It'd be nice to really have a nice, fresh, homegrown apple off the tree, but I'm not too concerned with it. I know that those trees are really just slow, and I wish I had planted myself a standard apple tree years ago instead of all these dwarfs that I have that just don't do much. They're just weak trees. But we've got them in place now, and we're going to feed that area hopefully pretty well with mulch. It's going to provide nice soil. And uh, hopefully those dwarf apple trees will come into their own in time. Um, and, you know, maybe next year we'll get a pretty decent apple crop off them. Also, the grapevines have been fruiting. Um, the grapevines have put out plenty of clusters. We ended up spraying them with Spectracide Immunox. That's a, actually an inorganic spray. That's the only one I use, and it really helps with black rot. And if it wasn't for black rot, I wouldn't be doing this, but... I don't get any any grapes without spraying that stuff and uh, a friend of mine uses it and swears by it so we're going to use it this year and we did it actually twice to really try to eradicate black rot and then next year we'll be back to one spray a year if you do it at the right time um, it's not a big deal so then we should have a pretty nice crop of grapes this year um, I'm seeing quite a few clusters we actually got the Everest seedless grape that I've been talking to you guys about for a long time um we've been talking about this everest seedless grape for a while if i type in everest seedless grape this is the grape that cornell bred and double a vineyard sells it and they just recently gave it a name and it's like a concord style grape but it's larger just as flavorful and it has better disease resistance is what i've been told so um i'm excited especially because Concord Seeded is really the the um, the grape that did well. You know, the Concord Seedless doesn't do well. It's a horrible grape. So to have now a larger disease-resistant seedless Concord grape, that is incredible. I love Concord grapes. Even if they were seeded, I it didn't even matter to me because – they're just so good. I love the slip skin nature of them. I love the flavor. Um, they have such an incredible flavor. This is the grape, by the way, Concord, that's used in Welch's grape juice and jellies and stuff like that. This is like the, the one of the most commercially produced grapes in um, the United States. It says here it's well adapted to the Northeast and um, moderate disease resistance. So I'm pretty excited about it. I'm going to be honest. We put this one on the west side of the house against the house and we're gonna have this thing kind of trellised up against the house it's gonna add you know some nice little protection and hopefully some you know shade to that side of the house at that time of day um, I that was really my objective with that if this was you know if this was my house I'd really cover that whole side of the house with uh, some sort of vine but you know I think this is sort of helping uh, helping the electric bill with the air conditioner. Um, let's see, what else did we do? We did some grafting, actually, of the persimmons. I need to go out there and graft figs. And we did a round of grafting the figs, and some of them it took and some of them didn't. So it may have been too early in the year, and we're kind of getting to that point where I really need to get them on because we're getting really hot. And uh, this is the kind of the time that a lot of that sap flow is happening and I want to get these on before that sap flows too much but it's already kind of too late so we're gonna see if we can really get pretty decent success with this but I've kind of not really been too worried about it because I've already have so many varieties as it is we I counted them up today and I have at least 260 varieties that I'm maintaining of course there's a uh, duplicates of certain varieties but um, 
at least in terms of like limbs and trees there's about 260 of them so uh, that's a lot and uh, yeah we'll see what happens with this but um, I'm not really sure what I'm gonna do this year with kind of the varieties that haven't taken I did start a lot of them in the closet and rooted them so um, it could just be that I'll take a lot of those one gallon size trees and just stick them into random pots that I can you know I've been putting in like four one gallon trees in um, in like a 15 gallon size pot you know or I've been putting two five gallons in a 15 gallon with one one gallon and that's kind of been making it easier to kind of accumulate more varieties and um, find a home for them so uh, let's see I've also been really impressed by very recently this blood orange and they've been I'm just very happy to see that they've been putting blood oranges in stores they've been commercializing them even the Cara Cara navel orange it just adds that nice berryness to uh, to a piece of citrus that I really love that berry flavor and a lot of different fruits that you can find. It adds a nice little complexity, I think. And it, it's something different than your standard, you know, orange as an example. Um, we've also been making about a salad every single day. If you follow me on social media, you'll know that that's the case. We've really been going crazy with this. The, like I said, the garden beds have been insane in terms of the cool loving crops so a salad has been made like basically every day it's so good um the arugula i really should just grow arugula from now on because that's the best one it does bolt very quickly out of all of them but it is so so good that uh it almost just doesn't make sense to grow any of the other ones um i think mizuna and spinach is pretty good so far, the Bloomsdale long-standing spinach has been long-standing, and also Swiss chard. Uh, I do like the komatsuna and the tatsoi, but uh, I think those are more for like cooking. And I guess Swiss chard is too, but you could actually eat the Swiss chard when it's more tender, just raw in a salad. Um. What else has been going on? The the Gumi is actually going really well. You can see a photo here of the Gumi. Um, I couldn't believe how many fruits are on this damn thing. They're very young plants. And they're nitrogen fixers. They just grow really well. And they fruit really well. They're supposed to put out really early fruit. In fact, my buddy in Georgia, Strudel Dog, he um, says it's one of his earliest fruits. And somebody actually mentioned to me that the honeyberry is the earliest fruit in temperate climates. But for me, the earliest fruit is the strawberry. And we actually just got today, and I'm going to kind of upload this to Google Photos here so you guys can see it. But we got our first strawberry today. And we're going to have a couple thousand at least. Um, I'm just shocked at the amount of production on these strawberry plants particularly Mara de Bois. We did a nice video on that, talking about the strawberries as well as the peaches. We're gonna come out here, actually, we did just a video on just the strawberries, but we're gonna come out with a video tasting the strawberries, talking about more about them, and then we're gonna do a nice little taste comparison between different varieties, um, especially even the alpine strawberries. We'll talk about why this is kind of so, so good and such a really incredible thing to grow here in my climate. Um, it looks like the photo is not uploading, but or it is uploading right now. There's quite a few photos to upload. But essentially, um, I was eating the strawberry. Funny story. I was eating the strawberry, taking a bite out of it. My first bite of my first strawberry. And I saw a deer lock eyes with me as I was eating the strawberry. <laughs> first off, there's really no deer in my area because we're on a very busy street. But they're all over the place certainly in this area I should correct that statement but we only really have one and I've always known it was one that comes in the backyard and kinda of does some damage and then that's it don't really see it again and I think cuz we're at the very end of where it has to go it has to go through quite a few backyards and quite a few areas to get to my backyard and then at the end of my backyard is the fence which then leads to the main street so it kinda of just 
turns around and runs away. You know what I mean? So I actually saw it during the day eating the strawberry. I couldn't believe that it was out during the day and I spotted it during the day. Um, and then I realized, oh, well, it ran away. And then I, I just like said, all right, we got to get some of this uh, liquid fence down, which is basically a spray that they don't like. It really smells like rotten eggs and it's horrible. And I think it was my buddy Chris, but I've heard this other places too. You could put some deer, uh, some human hair down, and that will be enough to deter deer. They smell that hair. They smell humans, and they they don't come in that area. So, pretty cool tip there. Um, let's see, and I'll probably do that once I run out of the liquid fence. But you know, I've got that right now, and that's what I'm using. Uh, but here's another picture, actually, of the strawberries and how productive they are. I can't believe it because there's a couple thousand of them and you can see there's probably at least like 1500 just in this bed. And this is the Mara de Bois which really is surprising me because I didn't think it fruited this much this early in the season. And I don't really ever remember it doing this. So I've been really impressed and um, yeah it's just really cool to see that this is happening. Uh, and it's just a far superior strawberry variety than almost any other strawberry I've ever eaten, except for the Alpines. So uh, even the Early Glow, which has been a big producer, puts out a nice strawberry. The flavor just doesn't compare. It just doesn't. Also, the currants have been going insane. I've been really impressed by that. Um, the gooseberries are fruiting. There's not many this year, I think because this particular plant took a big hit, but it is growing like mad. I've been impressed by a lot of the berry plants, the honey berries, the gummies, the gooseberries, the josta berries. All of it is just going insane. I'm really excited to see that because that means more fruit in later years. And it's been taking a while for them to get going. We also got some citrus trees in the mail. and We're going to do a nice video on that. Um, we did a nice little unboxing video. We also uh, been harvesting turnips, radishes. Uh, we've been harvesting many different types of lettuce, as I've said. We had the nice little bit there of asparagus. We were doing also, um, we still are doing quite a bit of the sugar snap pea. And also I'm now getting garlic scapes. And this has been something that I looked back at prior years and we're also way ahead of schedule on the garlic scapes. So we're going to do a video on the gar on the garlic scapes, talk about kind of what this means, what's, what to do, you know, all that. And uh, I've just been really weirded out and kind of figuring out why this is happening. But I looked up in the uh, book that I bought. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but Ron Engeland, I think, wrote the book. It's pretty much the definitive guide on growing garlic, and I can't remember what he said. <laughs> I can't remember why. I can't remember what he said on why the garlic has uh, put out um, scapes so soon. But I imagine it has a lot to do with. I think if he said that if there's not enough water. Um, and it's drier conditions, the it will kind of bolt prematurely. Um, but for certain, it's not been dry, and the soil where they're planted is not dry. So I don't think that's the reason. In fact, I think a lot of my garlic is just ready to go. And I planted a lot of garlic last year um, in anticipation to try to get them planted earlier. See if we could get larger bulbs this way. Uh, by planting them earlier in the season, really fiddle with the planting date. And according to Ron, a lot of the people in my area plant these things in October. And I tried even some plantings in August. I think the earliest planting I did was like August 15th of last year. So we'll see what happens with these things with the bulb sizes looking like. Some of them look great and some of them don't. So. I don't know, it's really hard to say. These things are really kind of getting more size as every day that goes on because we are getting close to that harvest time. And he said that basically you want about six leaves, six green leaves 
um, on the garlic plants when you harvest them. Anything less than six and you're kind of messing with the storage quality um, is what he came to the conclusion of. But here's actually, excuse me, here's actually a photo of the first strawberry. This is early glow. This was actually yesterday. Excuse me, guys. And then the Mar de Bois had one today. So, believe it or not, they're both ripening at the same time. But the Mar de Bois fruits not only right now in heavy quantities, but also fruits at the end of the season. Pretty much all the way from like August 1st to the end of the year in November 1st. It just doesn't stop. And, uh,. It doesn't make sense to me why even have June berries, I guess, now. Because these Mar de Bois are way tastier. And they put out so much more fruit. So my whole objective with the June berries was to get them one and done. And I think that's kind of why I do a lot of the June berries. It's just to kind of get a lot of fruit at one time when there's no SWD. When I have a lot of time to pick. Pick them all, freeze them, make them in the jam, and then that's it. You know. Whereas late in the season, I don't want too many things to pick because there's a lot to keep up with. There's a lot to harvest at a certain time of the year. So having too many of the Mar de Bois is not a good thing. But it is what it is. We've also had some Brevas dropping, and I don't entirely sure know why. I don't think anyone really knows why in terms of why Breva drop. Uh, some varieties are just unifera, and that's just what they do. Is they Sometimes they put out a Breva, and it never ripens. Other times, you certainly have bifera varieties, and they drop anyway. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the changing of the environment, changing of the climate. Um, if you get a lot of like humid days and then one day out of nowhere it's pretty dry, they tend to kind of drop. So it's very strange. I don't exactly know. I think a lot of people have theories, but no one really knows the exact reason. Um, so we've kind of covered a lot so far. Um, Let's see, let me think if there's anything else pressing that I want to mention to you guys. We are going to be coming out pretty soon with some seeds. We are going to come in here and seed some of the, actually the warm loving crops that I didn't get a chance to get in. We talked about corn, but also what has to go in is things like um, bok choy. And bok choy is actually one of those crops that grows, even though it's a brassica, I believe it's in the brassica family, that one does really well in the heat. And if you plant it too early, it's too cold, then it bolts. So it's really interesting how that works. And we'll see how this you know, pans out. And uh, I just have a lot of things left to do in the garden. Um, something that's really cool that's been happening is that the neighbor has uh, installed new LED lights all over the property and has basically lit up their entire property. So if I turn on the lights outside in the back, um, I can see outside and I can do work. So I've been able to, to be, and that's what I've been doing, is doing work outside for the last few days. It's been really nice. There's no mosquitoes this time of year. It's not cold. Um, and it's just very effortless. There's no sun beating on you, you know? So anyway, guys, that was this episode of Fruit Talk. I want to thank everybody for watching this one with me. Um, hopefully next week we're going to come at you guys with a legit topic. But I really did want to come at you guys and update everything that's been going on. Like I said, it's been a long time. And, um, you know, I like to kind of bother you guys and tell you guys about all this stuff instead of somebody else who just really doesn't want to hear it, you know, like a friend or a girlfriend, they just uh, get kind of bogged down and they're just like, you know, kind of shut up Ross because it's all you talk about is growing food and all that. So, um, yeah, you guys are my outlet for that. <laughs> but anyway, I want to thank everyone again. Uh, take care, everyone. Check out the new blog. Um, rossreddy.wixsite.com slash blog. Check out our social media. We're making lots of posts here. Really beautiful stuff, beautiful photos that we've been taking. It's all informative. 
just like the YouTube channel. Also, check out the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Um, I know a lot of you guys at this point have, but uh, you know, check us out youtube.com slash Ross Ratty. That's where the majority of our content is. And yeah, we'll catch you all guys for next week's episode. All right, take care. <laughs>